This week on The Laura Flanders Show, a Bernie Sanders-backing family farmer in coal country says all is not lost. In fact, the time to make the changes we need economically and politically is now. A black church-based solar project makes bottom-up power. And I have a few words to say about change and no change. I'm Laura Flanders, now more than ever. Welcome to the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. An organic farmer in southern Virginia with a penchant for labor unions, bottom-up power, and left-leaning policies. You would think that our next guest would be feeling a bit discouraged after the last election. But then you don't know Anthony Placovento. The founder of Appalachian Sustainable Development, he's worked with tobacco farmers, loggers, and miners, his neighbors, for transformative change for years. And he's not giving up. In fact, he sees potential in this moment to get down and dirty to do what we've needed to be doing for decades. In his latest book, published earlier this year, he introduces readers to scores of examples. That book is Building a Healthy Economy from the Bottom Up, Harnessing Real World Experience for Transformative Change. He's got a foreword by Bill McKibben. Anthony, welcome to the program. So glad to be here, Laura. Thanks so, am so much. I, am I misrepresenting your cheery mood? Uh, well, you certainly <laughs> caught me on a better day. <laughs> no, I mean, at this point, I, like everybody, am sort of in a state of shock and discouragement. But by the same token, I think this is probably the best opening we've had for really fundamental rethinking of our politics and its connections to local communities and local economy in a long, long time. Now, let's be clear. You supported Bernie Sanders. Absolutely. But you live in southwest Virginia. Right. Talk a little bit about your community, your fellows, political, economic, and otherwise. Right. So our area is uh, historically very dependent on tobacco farming, on coal mining. About 15, 20 years ago, tobacco uh, basically plummeted, lost most of its market share. And so myself and a bunch of other folks started working with tobacco farmers to try to help find alternatives, to make a transition out of tobacco to something that was better for people and the land. And it's been, um, I'd say, moderately successful. We've had some success with that. We're now at a point where the same thing is happening in a more challenging setting, which is with the coal industry. And as a result, you have a lot of people who are really hurting economically, for sure, but also people who are just absolutely fed up with the status quo because it simply hasn't been mm. working for them. So when they heard a message from Secretary Clinton about building on the progress made, for many of them it was like, what progress are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, this is a region that voted four to one, four in, to one. in some cases for, for Trump over Clinton. Absolutely. And yet, you know that I ran for Congress four years ago on a platform that you could sort of say was the rural version of Bernie Sanders, the working man's version. And I did best getting close to 50% of the vote in the worst hit counties, the coal county. So what that says to me is that had Sanders prevailed over Clinton, he probably wouldn't have won our district, but it wouldn't have been the kind of ratio you saw because he was speaking to their concerns and needs as well. So what are progressives doing wrong? Maybe progressives who are not as you are from these communities who maybe are just coming in from outside. One dimension, and it's both superficial but really important, is, is how we talk about it, we progressives, right? Number one, always way too many words. What does even progressive mean, if yeah. you don't mind me saying? Yeah, right, well, there's that, there's that <laughs> as well. But if you look at the white papers and the reports and the pronouncements, it's just too much contextualization, it's too much vagueness, there's, there's not that kind of uh, grab you and cl the clarity that people really long for. I think everybody, but particularly I'd say rural folks, long for a clear, simple, straightforward message. But it's not and just about rhetoric. No, it's not. So the, so the light, but the language reflects actually the actions very well too, which are also tend to be vague, sort of uh, tinkering around the edges rather than fundamental change. I mean, it's, it's really rather extraordinary. I was thinking the other day how the Republican Party has been quite open to or susceptible to a radical transformation from their right, right wing for 20 years since yeah. Newt Gingrich, and the Democrats always resist it. So, so you, have, you have kind of weak language that is describing weak policy, and then the third thing is you just have a disengagement from everyday people's lives, I'd say. I mean, for most farmers, miners, factory workers, 
uh, loggers. It's just they don't see the relevance of the agenda that's being talked about. Give us some examples of the work that you do and how you do it. Uh, because I think there are people after this election who look around and say, what country am I in? Right. How do I work with these people? Sure, um, sure. Some people said some really terrible things about each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. On lines of race and gender and all the rest. Oh, yeah. And there's no denying that. And, and the argument that I've been trying to make around the, the role that rural communities and working people could play doesn't in any way deny sort of the the horror of so much of what happened in this campaign and, and that has been building for eight years actually that that's true we have to combat that so some of the examples some are direct from my own experience and then some from the folks that I've um, gotten to know as colleagues around the country so in our own experience with just tobacco briefly what we had was a situation where an agricultural program that actually worked for small farmers sort of the the archetypal family farmer, was producing a product that wasn't good yeah. for people or the land. It was very chemically intensive. As tobacco was starting to decline, we started working with tobacco farmers and trying to emulate the best element of the tobacco program. And, and fundamentally, it was that they had a solid market. And second was that there was a whole infrastructure, a culture built around the rhythms of tobacco. So we tried to create a program where the same farmers were producing organic produce, but building a solid market and then investing in that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That's one uh, of countless examples of meeting people where they are, but not just accepting the status quo, but trying to move things in a better direction from a sustainability point of view. And politically, how do you do that in an environment where some of those people you might be working with have espoused really horrible racist views or misogyny? This situation that people find themselves in now is very confusing, I think, for a lot. Like, how do we, who do we connect with and where do we draw a line? I'll, I'll tell you a story from uh, when I was running for Congress in 2012, and I earned the support of the United Mine Workers, and that was very, very important in our district. Uh, but the, the UMWA, they knew where I stood on labor. They knew I had fought for them during the strike and, and the black lung issues, but they were nervous about me as an environmentalist. But I, I won them over by just talking very directly. Um, about two months into the campaign, the president announced his position on gay marriage. And I was coming that very day to a rally in Russell County, Virginia, and one of the old-time retired miners came up to me in the parking lot, a um, big supporter of mine, and he said, what do you think about that bombshell Obama's dropped on us? And I thought he was talking about the EPA, something, you know, something with the EPA. And uh, I, I looked at him, he said, you know, the gay marriage thing. So we had this conversation as we were walking through the parking lot to my little presentation. And ultimately, I said to him, you know, I, I, the way I see it, because he was quoting the Bible, I said, the way I see it, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to love people, especially the people that are hardest to love. And I, I mean, that might be hard to do, but I think that's something. And he said, well, yeah, I guess you're right about it. I suppose they're just born that way anyway. So it was like this little moment. I was off script with my pro-labor message that he loved into much murkier territory. So he has to love me for being hard to love because I'm gay. I have to love him because he's a white supremacist, <laughs> say? I don't know, but maybe. Maybe over time, because this doesn't happen, as you well know, in a year or two, maybe over time some of those views about women, about gays, about minorities change as people feel also valued themselves, yeah. as people's needs don't, as they don't feel that their needs, their issues are just fundamentally discarded by both parties, by big business, by the government. And, and perhaps as people feel some self-confidence, some control over their livelihoods, these other issues become things that they fundamentally yeah. are more tolerant about. I mean, the, the, the media description of the community you live in is very inaccurate, my experience yeah, from yeah. being there. For yeah. one thing, it is not purely a white zone. No. It is not a zone where only men work. Right. And any kind of economic justice is going to have to be racially integrated and women-centered, because that's who's doing the large part of the work. Particularly the alternative economic development work is being led by women, the grass, the really the grassroots economic so development if you're and really, environmental organizing as well. If you're really talking about Appalachian alternatives, which you're talking about, and if the history of the United States is kind of wither Appalachia, there, there goes the nation, um, how do you think an era of Trump economics will affect you? And secondly, how can we combat that in this era where politically you kind of have very few tools at your disposal? 
An awful lot of people in Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, and other rural areas are talking about economic transition now. And that's big in and of itself, because for generations you couldn't talk about anything other than coal. Transition implies something after coal. That's a step in the right direction. Uh, I tend to call that bottom-up economics, yeah. and there is definitely momentum building for it. The, the terrible irony of Trump being supported in so many of these communities is that he represents precisely the opposite, right. a, an utter return to trickle-down, the worst excesses of trickle-down economics. And so there's a pretty solid chance that he'll undo the little incremental progress that was happening, like Obama's power and power plus plan, which are providing investment into real economic alternatives, very, very yeah. solid ones. So somehow or other, I think our message during the Trump years has to stay very much focused on what's wrong with trickle down globalization, with wealth concentration, and keep working probably with less resources on building these bottom up alternatives, not just in Appalachia, but all over. Did as much get done under Obama's eight years as you would have liked to see? Oh, Lord, no. Absolutely not. Good things happened, um, and lots of things happened in many realms, but from an economic point of view, you know. He was disappointing. He was much, much more of a just off center kind of Wall Street guy. You know, McKibben says that it's too late for incremental progress because of climate change, that we, we can't allow the, I think he puts it, the slow, uh, graceful evolution of culture to make the change now. We've got to make fast change. So I think Obama represented that marginal incremental change. Trump represents potentially radical change in the wrong direction. Somehow in the midst of that craziness, we have to step up and increase the pace of this development of this healthy bottom-up economy. Bernie Sanders was your preferred candidate. Do you think in general Democrats are your allies, the Democratic Party is currently constituted? We're having a meeting in about a week in our rural 9th District of Virginia to talk about fundamentally trying to reform the Democratic Party in our part of the world from the bottom up. I think there's more openness than before, but the fact of both Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi's re-election to the key power positions is uh, certainly disheartening. So again, that just says like the rest of uh, the work that you and I have been doing all these years is we got to make it happen from the bottom up ourselves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it's going to come from the top of the Democratic Party. Finally. Talk a little bit more about what basically you have been saying for decades about the need to connect economic justice and justice for working people with the kind of grand, liberal, most often northeast-based uh, um, articulated agenda. What do you know that, and your, your colleagues know that we need to understand better? Maybe I can talk about that through a, a couple of examples. So one of um, one of the fine fine um, entrepreneurial nonprofits in Appalachia is MESA, the Mountain Association for Community Economic Development in Berea, Kentucky. And among many interesting projects that they've done over the last few years, one of them um, is called Kentucky Smart, and it's an on-bill financing program. So Mesa looked at the issue that many poor and working poor people were living in trailers or drafty homes, paying hundreds of dollars every month, still not staying warm, um, and you know adding to the uh, emissions, right? So the dilemma was the change that needed to happen, the double-pane windows, the new heating system, the insulation, they simply couldn't afford it. Mesa created the financing program so that all of that work would be done for family, and now over 200 households have been done. All of that work would be done. They would pay it back through savings on the bill. So the family didn't have to go into debt. They got a warmer, higher value home. Uh, they reduced their ecological footprint, and uh, they were able to be proud because they were doing it of their own resources. That's one of countless emerging examples where a kind of very direct connection between an economic outcome, a family being warmer with a more valuable home, and an environmental outcome, less energy in, less pollution out, are woven into a community-based solution that if replicated across not just Appalachia but much of the country would have astonishing implications for jobs, for reduced emissions, for energy efficiency potential. It needs to be supported by the kind of public policies, things like tax credits for energy efficiency, changes in state corporation commission laws that allow these type of things to happen in association with utilities. So that's a microcosm of the kinds of 
innovative possibilities that are emerging. The problem is they're all small because our public policy favors the big guys. It favors the extractors and the polluters. If we just had a level playing field, these things could provide the model for the sort of integrated change, connecting justice and environment. Is what happens in Appalachia relevant to the rest of us? I think it is because, uh, number one, still a lot of the energy that powers the country comes from Appalachia. As coal declines, fracked gas from western Pennsylvania has increased. So there's still that issue. So if we want a clean energy future, we better get Appalachia and rural America on board. And also politically, you know, how many years have they been saying, well, the demographics favor the Democrats? Well, apparently not enough. So again, I don't think there's anything to lose by the Democratic Party and progressives more broadly to really focus on what are the possibilities of connecting the, the issues that the folks in Buffalo have that are working with Push Buffalo, working people, poor people, with the same sorts of issues that people have in eastern Kentucky and southwest Virginia. What's to be lost by taking a risk on that kind of a strategy? Is it just a matter of paying more attention to poor white people? I think that's what a lot of people are hearing. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, now we have to pay yet more attention to white people. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a really good question, and there's certainly issues of when people of privilege start losing that privilege, then all of a sudden it's yeah. a big deal, and other people have been, you know, much further down the ladder for a long, long time. There's, that's a real issue. But white so people are not the only people I see when I go to the hollows of right, Virginia. Right, right. They're definitely not. I mean, you, you have certainly a small, small contingent of African Americans, but you also have an emerging Latino population and from other parts of the world as well. So I don't know if it's a matter of paying more attention to poor white people as it is just fundamentally reor reorienting our policy policies towards livelihoods. I mean, how do we enable people to do the work they need to do to have a, a secure and reasonably good life? That's the core issue. Again, whether, whether it's, you know, what Corbin Hill Food Project's doing in the South Bronx or whether it's what we're doing in Southwest Virginia. It's still, it, it's very different in the particulars, of course, but the, what, what we've lacked in our policy and in our public discourse is this drive towards how do we build sustainable livelihoods. I heard a rumor of something exciting happening in St. Paul. Yes. Your St. Paul. Yes. The, one. the other St. Paul. St. <laughs> Paul is a town of 975 people, a half hour west of Abingdon, where I am, in the heart of the coal fields. Terrible unemployment rate, poverty rate. Has a great farmer's market that we help them get going. Has their own brewery, for goodness sakes. And now uh, we are going to be working on a project to help design uh, an ecological campus. Now, this may not work. But the idea is integrating ecological education based around mountain ecology and river ecology with the Clinch River with green business development. This could be really big for Appalachia. You take a, a tiny little town, poor town in the heart of the coal fields. If they, over the next 10 years, could become a focal point of integrating uh, ecological stewardship with business development, green business development, it would be f phenomenal. And where the heck do you come from, Anthony? Did you, how did you come to be doing this work? What's your background? I was born in Manhattan, not just a few blocks up from here, and I got real interested in, in uh, farming as a young man, and so I started out farming in Kentucky and then in southwest Virginia, and all along with just a very, very strong uh, kind of urge towards building a more just society. That was really what I wanted to do. I didn't know how to do it. So pretty much to the degree that I know anything about it, to the degree that you know my writings say anything about it, it's pretty much all from experience, just doing it, making mistakes, and bouncing back. All right. The book is Building a Healthy Economy from the Bottom Up. Anthony Flacavento has been our guest. You can find out more at our website. Anthony, thank you so much. Thank you, Always Laura. great to talk with you. Absolutely. That was Anthony Flaccavento. We have a limited number of his books available for subscribers to this program. So go to our website and subscribe. Next up, we have an excerpt from the documentary Democratized Electricity, the inspiring story of a neighborhood in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that was determined to imagine, plan, and build a successful solar electric generator facility that now provides clean, renewable power. The documentary interviews the many people involved in the group that made this happen and how they replaced their need for coal, gas, and nuclear power with the power of their community. We're doing a film to get 
renewable energy into communities across the country. The last few years I've been watching what's been happening around the world with environmental damage and, and climate change and I realized there's just something more I needed to do. When uh, Barbara Trent approached me as one of the neighbors in the neighborhood and said, what if we collectively work together as a group and we create our own solar farm? And there are quite a few of us that got rather excited because we felt like this is part of what we are speaking to about the, uh, to the outside world and we support every day. Or alternatively, along with eight other neighbors, we created an LLC, a limited liability corporation, and installed a 5.2 kilowatt array of solar panels that now produces electricity for the grid. Being able to create solar, sell it into the grid, was, was just a powerful thought to me that we could get away from coal and other, you know, use renewable instead. We knew if we could do it, Anybody could do it, literally, trust me, okay. So we shot the entire process from beginning to end. We've interviewed people in several neighborhoods in an attempt to put together a half hour video that would help inspire, educate, and invigorate people around the country to do similar projects. I am totally confident that my, I will be able to recoup my investment in the next six years. That is not why I invested. If I did not recoup all that money, I would still feel ethically that it is absolutely the right thing to do. The impact of our solar system has been phenomenal. We've become a real life example that stewardship, solar energy, sustainability is a reality. It just takes a, a, a little bit of work uh, and then you have a system that is, uh, that, that's saving you money and you're being a great steward. I am an energy producer, so the community says we are energy producers. That's, that's a lot in that statement. It's a lot of pride and it's a lot of um, connectiveness that we are accomplishing something that uh, is sustainable. We have a monitor so that every Sunday, as people come in, they not only see how much we've produced through the week, they see how much that we've produced annually, they see what we've saved as far as CO2. But when you make that conversion, they can see it every, every Sunday, then it raises the consciousness, and that impacts, and then that really makes you begin to think about, well, what am I doing as an individual? How am I contributing? Uh, it, and it's good to see as a church, but it really kind of acts as a catalyst. And all we need to do is have people think. Think about what are the consequences of my actions. And every day I look outside and it's sunny, I'm thinking, I'm making green energy. This is great. <laughs> that was a snippet from the documentary, Democratized Electricity. To learn more and find out how to support the Joe Max Solar Initiative and maybe how to make something like it happen in your community, go to the website of the Empowerment Project. That's empowermentproject.org. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders for the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn. The incoming Trump administration is placing unprecedented power in the hands of people, some of whom are actually called Mad Dog, and all of whom could be. It's stressful and frightening for progressives, but the one thing it shouldn't be is a shock. At the Laura Flanders Show, I feel as if we started covering this election back in 2008. The racism, nativism, sexism, anti-Semitism, ableism, and trans-homo and Islamophobia that Trump leveraged in November was clearly visible in the Tea Party then. The anti-Obama backlash was always a great gateway for bigots into the GOP, and it worked the other way too, channeling economic dis-ease into scapegoating and violence. The reality was, and still is, that those hurting most were of color, not white, and disproportionately unpaid moms, not men losing blue-collar jobs. The economic mess that went mainstream in 08 hit those people a decade before. The bigger point is, it didn't take fake news sites to set up a binary splitting economic from social justice. Mainstream money media have been making that divide forever, even as they cut other more intersectional perspectives out.
Plenty of people have spent the last century calling for systemic change in our economy and our politics. Going back to Reconstruction, there have been those like W.E.B. Du Bois who said we could choose cooperation or competition, but in all likelihood we couldn't have both. Now the work of independent media like ours is more important than ever. So here's the deal. We'll keep reporting on the drivers of inequality and environmental catastrophe. We'll keep covering the people, especially the women and people of color whose work changes perceptions about what is possible if we work together for the good of all, not just the wealth of some. And we'll rely on you to cooperate and partner with us. There are lots of ways you can do that but we need to be able to reach you. So I'm asking you, please, to sign up for news from us. We have a lot of good stuff coming, and we're all going to need good stuff in the mad dog times ahead. Go to our website, find out more, and see all of our archives at lauraflanders.com. And write to me. Tell me what you think. laura at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. Mm -hmm.